Hey guys, near the end of my previous video, I mentioned the hypothetical need for something called a contactor. I've done a bunch of research into this and now I'm ready to share what I've learned with you. Just like gas powered vehicles, electric vehicles need some sort of main power shutoff switch to cut power when the vehicle is off. Vehicles with internal combustion engines use the ignition in conjunction with a series of electromechanical switches called relays. For electric vehicles, there's basically two different strategies for handling the on off switch. Either an electromechanical switch, basically a high power relay, or a solid state switch like the MOF set that's built into the battery management system. Each switching strategy has its own pros and cons, and which approach makes the most sense for a given application depends on a variety of things. I've put together a couple PowerPoint slides, so let's head over to the computer and I'll walk you through what I've learned about both strategies and what I think makes sense for my project. Let's start by talking about the solid state switch strategy, and that's the MOF set on the battery management system. As you might already know, the battery management system has the ability to cut off the flow of electricity to protect the battery. It does that with a solid state switch called a MOF set. That stands for Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor. Without getting into the literal quantum physics that govern the behavior of doped semiconductors, and for the sake of this video we're just going to pretend that it's basically witchcraft. All you really need to know is that MOF sets work really well all the time in billions with a B, billions of devices all around the world, every day. Easy example, the computer or phone or tablet that you're watching this on is using MOF sets in the processor to decide where power should be going. With that said, let's outline the main pros and cons of a MOF set solid state switch. My battery management system already has a MOF set. I wouldn't have to buy anything new. On the other hand, if something fails, that means the battery management system is toast. Also, MOF sets fail shorted. In other words, it remains connected to full power until they melt, and that could expose the battery to damage. Additionally, there is a voltage drop across the MOSFET, which means that it consumes energy which generates heat, which heat then needs to be dissipated. So depending on the MOSFET, it may not be able to handle hundreds of amps. If not, an integrated circuit that is rated for hundreds of amps probably employs a parallel array of several MOSFETs. However, that means that if a single MOSFET fails, then all of the other MOSFETs in that array are subject to relative higher amperage each, which could lead to progressive failure. Last but not least, great thing about MOSFETs is they have no moving parts. That's why they call it a solid state switch. Because there are no moving parts, they are tested and rated for hundreds of millions, if not billions of switching cycles. Now, to get to those hundreds of millions or billions of switching cycles, you need to be operating within the rated capacity for power. Okay, so now that we understand the solid state switching option, let's talk about the electromechanical option, a separately installed contactor. If you're not familiar, a contactor is really just a high power relay. In either case, they're called electromechanical switches because they use an electromagnet to move a mechanical contact to switch the flow of electricity. This is particularly useful when you want to use a low power command to switch a high power circuit. For example, when you turn the key to start your car, a low power signal triggers a relay that connects the battery to the starter motor, allowing hundreds of amps of 12 volt power to flow. In the case of an electric vehicle, there's still hundreds of amps, but the voltage system is much higher. In my case, I'm using 72 volts, which means that the amount of power is a lot higher. Low power electromechanical switches are called relays and high power electromechanical switches are called contactors. You'll also sometimes hear either of these called solenoids. Contactor design ratings can vary widely depending on the application. For example, normally closed versus normally open, coil voltage, switching voltage, contact amperage, etc. Given that they are high power devices, arcing is pretty much guaranteed to happen if it's actuated while there is a potential difference across the terminals. Arcing can damage the conductive contacts and reduce the useful lifetime of the contactor. 
Companies that design and sell contactors use a couple of techniques to prevent and mitigate damage from arcing, such as cleverly placing magnetic fields to push the ionized arcs away from the contact area, and also operating the device in a sealed chamber that has been flooded with gases to displace oxygen and also inhibit arcing, drastically increasing their useful lifetime. It's typical for modern contactors to be rated for tens or even hundreds of thousands of cycles. In my electric vehicle application, I'm pretty sure arcing would be very rare since the motor would not generally be calling for power while the contactor is opening or closing the circuit. In fact, some electromechanical switches for electric vehicles are just open to the air because arcing is so rare. This configuration of high power electromechanical switch is more often referred to as solenoid. With that said, let's summarize the main pros and cons of electromechanical switches. A contactor would be mechanically and electrically separate from other components in the system. That means I would have to buy an extra thing, but it would also be able to fail separate. So pro and a con there. Also, a contactor can fail in the open or shut position. If it were to fail in the open position, then everything is protected, everything's safe. And if it were to fail in the shut position, there's still the battery management system MOSFET, which is basically a redundant switch system. So contactors are physically air-gapped when the circuit is open, and when the circuit is closed there's an energized electromagnet holding it in place. Contacts can wear over time due to buildup from carbon and pitting from arcing, but that's not generally going to be a problem for me because I don't expect arcing. Another fact of contactors is it has physically moving parts, and so it's rated for a lot fewer cycles than a MOSFET strategy. So, which switching strategy is best? If you want the highest level of safety and redundancy, a contactor is probably better. If you wanted to minimize cost and reduce the number of components in your build, the battery management system MOSFET would be better. For my build, I'm going to buy a contactor. The added cost is fairly minor relative to the overall build cost, and I like the safety and redundancy that it provides. So now that I know I want a contactor, I've got the problem of procuring a contactor. If you google up contactors, there's a whole bunch of specs and parameters listed, and at a minimum, I need to specify what I already know about my system. So, for example, the minimum contact amperage should be at least 200 amps, because that's what my motor controller is rated for. And my minimum switching voltage needs to be 90 volts, because that's just a hair above the fully charged lithium iron phosphate battery voltage. I also need to specify the coil voltage. The coil voltage is how much energy is required by the electromagnet that actuates the contacts inside the contactor. If I wanted to operate the contactor with my full battery voltage, I would need this to be 72 volts. Looking around a little bit, it seems like there's a much larger market for contactors with coil voltages in the 12 volt, 24 volt, and 48 volt categories. That being the case, I'm going to assume that I want to operate the contactor with the step down voltage that I'll be getting from my DC DC converter. So let's set my required coil voltage to 12 volts. Even when narrowing my Google search with those parameters, there's still a ton of options. Another parameter you'll see in contactor product descriptions is something called contact form. The contact form actually has three pieces of information. First is the number of poles, and then the number of throws, and then the circuit state when the coil is not energized. So here's a diagram that shows the differences between a single and double pole, single and double throw. It's actually more complicated than I would have guessed, but lucky for me, my use case is pretty simple. I just need a basic on off switch on a single circuit, meaning I want a single pole, single throw contactor, which is abbreviated SPST. And when not energized, I want to prevent electricity from flowing. In other words, it should be normally open or NO. With that additional requirement, googling around for contactors that have these parameters still returns a lot of results. So an additional discriminator that I learned about is whether the contactor has an internal economizer or not. Turns out an economizer is a way for the contactor to use high power during that initial pull in and then a lower power to hold the contacts in place after they're already touching. And this is accomplished either through the use of dual coils or through a small circuit board that provides pulse width modulation. This will reduce the steady state power consumption and consequently also help reduce the amount of heat generated over time. Some contactors are commercially available with built-in economizers. 
and others are ready for an economizer to be separately or externally wired in. For my project, I think having the economizer built in would be much more convenient than trying to find and wire in an external economizer. So to summarize, I want my contactor to have the following characteristics. A minimum contact amperage of 200 amps, a minimum switching voltage capability of 90 volts, coil voltage of 12 volts, single pole, single throw, normally open, and have a built-in economizer. So digikey.com is a website that sells all sorts of electronics for industry and has a pretty good product filtration system. So let's head over to that website and punch in our parameters. Okay, so here we are on digikey.com in the electromechanical switches section for things titled contactors. They've got 8,000 different products, so let's do some filtering. Let's start with the current rating. We'll say anything greater than 200 amps, and we'll apply that. That brings us down from over 8,000 to less than 800. And let's see, coil voltage, we said we wanted 12 volts. We'll just select everything that has 12 volts in the range, apply that. And uh, let's see, we want single pole, single throw, normally open, apply that. Our switching voltage needs to be anything greater than 90 volts. So we'll just select all of these. And at this point, we can start making some pragmatic filtration. We'll say, you know, I, I only want active products. N nothing that's obsolete and then uh, also down here in the stocking options I want things that DigiKey normally keeps on hand that brings us down to just 53 results which is a lot fewer than 8,000 but still more than I want to sort through so let's say uh, I want my contact rating to be uh, 250 amps that's a good step above my max expected current and I'll just say apply there so that brings us down to just 16 results and in theory, any one of these will work perfectly fine because we filtered by all those metrics and parameters. Because any of these will work, and I am a cheapskate, we're going to filter by price. Go from low to high. And you can see here, four out of the top five results are this one model, AEV250, and then a couple different dash numbers at the end. So let's just click on one of these and, and take a look at the product page. It says they've got a whole bunch in stock that can ship immediately. Let's take a look at the data sheet. So let's see, it's good to 900 volts and it actuates at 12 volts DC and it's got a built-in coil economizer, highly reliable. Ah, here you go, nomenclature. So the AEV250 is the base part number and then the first letter tells you what voltage it's rated for. So all of these ones should be dash M because we told it we wanted a 12 volt contactor. And then these last letters give us some additional options. N means it's got non-polar load terminal. So a little side note here, this was a little confusing to me at first because I know that a switch is just a mechanism for opening or closing a circuit. So I didn't understand how it could be polarized. Turns out the polarization is related to the internal magnetic fields. When the current is flowing in a certain direction, the arc has a certain polarization, which means you can preferentially push that arc in a certain direction with a cleverly designated magnetic field. The non-polarized version has an extra magnet to make sure it pushes the arc away regardless of which direction the current is flowing. So it makes sense to have a polarized contactor if you're always expecting the current to be going one direction. So you can optimize those magnetic fields to always push the arc into one direction or the other. Given that my electric vehicle application is unlikely to arc in operation, I don't think this matters either way. But I personally like the idea of being officially insensitive to current direction, so I'm just going to get the non-polarized version. Having selected the non-polarized option, there's just one more option to consider, and that's whether to get auxiliary contacts. So you can see on the left here is a version of this contactor that does not have the auxiliary contacts. The red and black wires here are for the 12 volt to energize the electromagnet coil. The right here is a version of this contactor that has the auxiliary contacts, and you can see in the picture that's these white wires here. From what I can tell, the auxiliary contacts really just provides an optional extra circuit that is also switched by the contactor except that extra circuit just has a much lower current and voltage rating. Maybe that'd be useful for like an indicator lamp or an interlock circuit of some sort. I'm not sure I'd ever need that but for the few bucks that it costs extra to have the auxiliary circuit there I'd rather have it and not need it. 
than need it and not have it. And worst case, I could just tape up or clip off those auxiliary wires and pretend they don't exist. So there you have it. Everything you never wanted to know about contactors and how they work and what their various rated metrics mean in relation to their function. Hopefully that's helpful to somebody out there. And I think that's a really good stopping point for today. The next thing to work on would be updates and added details to my wiring plan and some good old fashioned unboxing of components I've been ordering and then I will be wanting to set up a bench test. Probably break that up into a couple videos, we'll see how long they go. Either way, feel free to leave any questions or feedback you may have in the comment section. If I don't have a good answer for your question, hopefully someone else will. And subscribe if you want to follow my progress. Thanks for watching.